Helmut Lang once dominated the fashion world, but after some bad business moves that saw the loss of their namesake designer, a few bad years led to the brand almost going bankrupt. But now they are finally back with Peter Doe at the helm in what seems to be a very successful revival. Helmut Lang started his business well before it was officially begun in 1977. He'd been making clothes for himself and for friends when he realized that he had a made-to-measure business going on, opening his studio officially in 1977. This was so successful, in fact, that he opened his first boutique in Austria in 1979 when he was just 23 years old. And according to this documentary, he would start producing dated collections from this point. This would begin in 1980 to coincide with his first fashion show that was held in the Secession Building in Vienna, financed only by him and his friends, so with no financial backing. He actually held, I believe, two shows in total around this time. But after the shows, financially he was in such a pickle that there was nothing left for the Repo Man to collect from him personally, and so instead, the Repo Man would bring him sandwiches to eat. However, despite this financial difficulty, because of Lang's links to the artistic scene in Austria that he made through clubbing, his collections became increasingly more noted in the art scene, especially due to his relationship with the photographer Elfie Simatan, and he quickly became a respected designer within that scene. So much so that by 1986, he alone was invited to show his work as part of an exhibition called Vienne 1880-1937 L'Apocalypse Joyeuse at Le Centre Pompidou in Paris as part of an initiative by the Austrian government to show off Austrian talents. In this exhibition, he would debut his very first fashion show in Paris, exposing him to the press that that brings, which in turn would thrust the man and his namesake into the fashion consciousness. The collection, which for the first time featured both men's and women's fashions together, obviously was not in the style that he would come to be known for quite yet, but it had started in that direction and it was shocking to the media at the time. It was extremely minimal in comparison to the other popular designers in the late 80s like Christian Lacroix, but unlike future Helmut Lang, there was still this desire to be sexy in that uniquely 80s way. We did, however, get introduced to their signature minimal colour palette, close, narrow cuts, high armholes, flat front trousers, sheath dresses, all of which would come to be defining features of the brand, as would the woolen and cotton fabrics used throughout. Many critics dubbed this as anti-fashion, and thusly, it became an immediate sensation. But because he had already been in business for 10 years, he knew by 1987 how to transfer this hype into an actual business, meaning that for production of his main line, he started two contracts, one with Zamasport in Italy, the same company that produced for Romeo Gigli and would later produce for McQueen, and in Japan with Mitsubishi, under their brand Onward, which according to this conversation I had with Endima, who owns the largest archive of Helmut Lang, was probably to circumvent customs charges for those in Asia just to keep the price points lower, which was a tactic many designers were using in this time period. In fact, Lang was very commercially viable right from inception, and that would truly prove to be his saving grace, as design-wise, he was before his time, and critically, he wasn't really appreciated just yet, with a great example being his Autumn Winter 89 collection that garnered mixed reviews for simply not being seen as revolutionary. He did maintain sales, of course, he made very commercial garments, but he was still an in-the-know designer, not yet a household name. To quote this article with Caro Rollo, New York designers like Michael Kors had a comparable look that costs less. Despite how it seems the brand is remembered today, it really wasn't until the 1991 recession began to influence fashion that Helmut would see a major rise in popularity. Obviously, following any recession, having large logos or ostentatious design is bound to fall out of fashion, and the 80s styles obviously died quite quickly. As a result of that, in the 90s, a few distinct styles, many of which had actually started in the 80s, came into popularity, like grunge, deconstruction, and of course, minimalism. None of these were immediately liked by the fashion press though, and the turn in press reception of these movements is very noticeable if you look back at these sources. 
Before the recession, this New York Times article was not particularly polite, as Lang heightened his minimal style to the one that is remembered fondly today for his Spring Summer 91. And likewise, this Le Monde article compared Helmut Lang's design for his Autumn Winter 91 collection to a flea market as a possible commentary on said recession. But by 1992, as the recession was truly in full force, the Washington Post called Lang the most articulate spokesman of this harsher reality. So his rise to stardom was particularly quick, to the effect that this book that I've been reading for the upcoming Life and Death of Alexander McQueen video said that Helmut Lang was the most sought-after designer in Paris by 1992. Furthermore, in general, fashion was evolving to a more media-based model at this time, which later would be famed due to LVMH's expansion that pitted Galliano and McQueen against each other to boost Dior and Givenchy's profiles in order to make more sales to the mid-masses. But this time, in the early 90s, that meant that for Lang and other designers in his realm, it was a tricky time for any one designer to blossom alone, as the media often discussed them as a group often in a way that was a little reductive of their individual styles, as Sarah Moa expresses in this documentary. Prada, Jill Sander and Helmut Lang, who all started showing minimalism in the late 80s or mid-70s in Jill's case, had all grown together as their minimalistic styles became the big trend of the early 90s, as well as the deconstructed trend that, because of his use of paint, cutouts and deconstruction, also saw Lang later lumped together with designers like Margiela and Ander Müllermeister, who were now being seen as the alternative to big-budget opulence of the 80s and then later Dior and McQueen. Yet while Galliano and McQueen were getting press attention, Helmut Lang was more successfully transferring his designs into regular sales. Their garments were consistent, easy to wear, utilitarian, fashionable, and exceptionally well-constructed, yet he still retained creative credibility in his catwalk shows due to the infusion of just the right amount of media attention-grabbing garments, for which the rubber dress, which debuted in Spring Summer 92 especially, had grown a cult following, with The New Yorker even doing a dedicated piece on the dress in 1993 and again in 1997. So for Helmut Lang, this meant a cult following of young buyers and dedicated regular shoppers. This was really possible due to Lang's insistence on repeating shapes, styles, and textures throughout his entire career, something that makes a Helmut Lang piece so recognizable today and made it such a great investment in the recession that kicked all of this off. By 1993, their brand had 15 stores across Japan and the main line was sold in 21 stores worldwide. The brand had grown and it had grown quickly, but he was also on the cusp of his next huge collection. Autumn Winter 94 was yet another breakout collection for Lang, specifically due to a rubber and lace sleeveless dress that played perfectly into the hands of his cult followers that we discussed before with The New Yorker. This is one of, if not the, most important designs in his career, as it was whisked away to all the magazines for shoots. However, because of a switch in the manufacturers from Zamasport to Gibo, only 99 were ever created, meaning that the supply and demand was skewed to make the dress all that more desirable, which in turn made Helmut Lang the brand a household name. By 1995, their sales volume had doubled on the previous year, and they had opened their first store in Munich, Germany, in a contract with German hotelier Erika Volkhardt. He also had a second store planned in early 1996 in Milan, and Helmut Lang's shoes and men's underwear was being rolled out to their European stockists for the 1996 summer season, expanding on their entry point products that would introduce a younger or uninitiated customer into the surprisingly not too expensive world of Helmut Lang. By 1997, Helmut Lang was one of the top designers in Paris and was actively tried to be poached by the big brands most notably Balenciaga, who Lang turned down the head designer role for in order to open his own jeans line off the back of the wildly successful painter jeans that were included in the spring-summer 98 menswear collection. However, this did start to bring into question of if one man, without this kind of financial backing, can bring his company into the leagues of success that he was being compared to. As part of his expansion plan, Lang had the company move to New York in 1997, and soon after, for Autumn Winter 98, would put on their first show across the pond. However, 
This was no ordinary show, as as a way to reach his customer more directly, it would be the first fashion show ever to be live-streamed on the internet, 10 years before Alexander McQueen popularized the format. Furthermore, it would also function to launch HelmetLang.com, his online store, which also was set up to reach the customer more directly, years before other luxury labels would come into the space. Unfortunately though, this too was ahead of its time, well before the internet was as big as it is now, and actually proved quite difficult for editors and buyers to find and watch the show, leading to some contradictory reviews that were both happy that he was pushing for tech fashion, but sad that they missed it. I'm pretty sure this would have required a dial-up connection to watch, so it makes sense that despite being obviously groundbreaking, it just wasn't as positively received at the time as it is seen now. Though, despite that, his no show was still the most talked about show of the season because it was hard to access and thus was an enormously popular show. But this wasn't the only way he was innovating for promotion. Starting in the same year to promote the website, Lang commissioned billboards in New York as well as 1,000 posters on taxis to be shown throughout the city, the first for a luxury brand. Before this, many luxury brands saw that as beneath them. But Lang, once again, proved the industry wrong and boosted his profile even higher. He also used light to advertise his perfumes, which launched a little later in 2000, and in general, all of his advertising was more brand-based than it was product-based, i.e. he wasn't always showing you a bag or even clothes in the advert, it was just much more about the feeling that he wanted to evoke. Helmut Lang was now a designer with significant heft, who would soon, thanks to his off-schedule habits, change the entirety of the fashion week season. For spring summer 99, he announced he would be preparing to show his collection off-season in early July 1998, months before the official schedule was set for November. But because he was such a huge draw for critics and buyers, Soon half of the scheduled New York Fashion Week designers followed suit within the same season, which led to New York Fashion Week having a split season for Spring Summer 99 and from Autumn Winter 99 being the first in the Fashion Week season for every season following that, something still enacted to this day. He had demonstrated serious heft in the industry, boasted an $100 million turnover, and so once again, the big brands came knocking, though this time with buyout offers. In 1999, he sold a stake of 51% to the Prada Group, who were always the brand he had been compared to the most, so it seemed at first like the best parent company for the Helmut Lang brand. But Prada very quickly ran the company into the ground. This was for a multitude of reasons, a main one being that the minimalism trend was dying and Lang had designed himself into a box by using such heavily repeated garments, but also because Prada, trying to follow the LVMH model of having a big, buzzworthy show to sell leather goods to the mid-masses as a cash cow, failed to realise that Lang already had a cash cow doing just that in his jeans line, which had an enormous markup at $200 retail while being relatively cheap to produce. But instead, in an effort to position the Helmut Lang brand in a more exclusive luxury space, cut the license agreement entirely to bank on Lang designing an IT bag, which he was never able to do, probably because the minimalism trend was dying. The Prada Group had promised him global expansion in terms of stores, a better distribution channel, and more sales-inducing small leather goods, but due to consistent clashing of creative control and sales figures falling to half of what they once were, most likely due to the loss of their biggest cash cow, these expansions never materialized. They did try to solve this by bringing the collections back to Paris from spring 2002, but because of 9-11, it was shown online so that he personally could remain in New York. They did eventually move over at Prada's request by autumn winter 2002, though it didn't help and sales just continued to crash. By 2004, their relationship had really soured and Helmut Lang the person sold his remaining shares to the Prada Group in October 2004, pending his departure in January 2005, before the Autumn Winter 05 show. The death of the brand was brutally swift, and it never really recovered. 
Their last show was Spring 05, and already by 2006, Prada announced that after six years of consistent losses, they would sell the Helmut Lang brand to Link Theory Holdings in Tokyo for around 50 million euros. Under Link Theory Holdings, the brand was relaunched at the end of 2006, start of 2007, with Michael and Nicole Kolovos, who had come from the LA-based brand Habitual as co-creative directors. Their first collection was Spring Summer 07, but it was really only a capsule collection and was just intended as a retail offering to stock their new Aoyama store and their newly relaunched website, which meant that this Spring 2007 collection was available from late 2006 through to the end of summer 2007. Furthermore, the brand had been relaunched as a contemporary brand, so specifically not a luxury brand, which would end up quite significantly damaging the Helmut Lang brand name. By their first quote real collection, Spring Summer 08, the brand had already been set up as an unofficial subsidiary line, the already accessible prices of the Helmut Lang brand were lowered further, the quality was likely lowered as well, and it just became a shell of what it had once been. This new Helmut Lang brand was not the same as the original. It was the same company, but it had completely different positioning, a completely different customer base. It even divided the men's and women's shows into separate events, which really went against Lang's original vision for the shows that had become known for being co-gendered even since the beginning. In short, to those who had known and loved the Helmut Lang brand, this was a real low point for the company. Link Theory Holdings, however, expected it to be profitable in this space, but they literally never mention Helmut Lang in their annual reports bar this one line in 2012, so we can very easily assume that that never really came to happen. Michael and Nicole left the company after eight years, with their last collection being the Autumn Winter 14 collection, and the company was left with no head designer, late running orders, systematic challenges, and a brand that most people had simply stopped talking about. The company then went through several years of very public rough times. They tried licensing collabs with brands like Uniqlo starting 2014, but even with that, they hadn't been profitable in several years and they clearly needed something to change. In March 2017, Isabella Burley, the editor of Days and Confused, came in as an editor in residence. She wasn't a designer, but she oversaw business decisions like the 2017 Travis Scott capsule collection, the introduction of Mark Howard Thomas to produce the menswear line, a re-edition line that would bring back iconic garments from the archive every four months, and a collection with Shane Oliver of Hood by Air, who I have a video on, which was the Spring Summer 18 collection. However, none of these were particularly critically well received. But this wasn't really their aim. It doesn't seem like this was their aim, as they were just meant to inject money into the business, which they did succeed in doing. Yet despite this, the brand went on hiatus yet again, not producing shows for around a year, while in January 2018, Isabella Burley was replaced by Alex Brown, and by August 2018, they laid off most of their staff to restructure and consolidate the entire organization. It became clear that this period was just for the money. It was certainly a risk, and at the time it did not seem like it was paying off. What they got in cash, they had lost in brand equity. By this point, Mark Howard Thomas had quit, and subsequently no one was talking about Helmut Lang anymore. Except for when their company was brought up nostalgically, of course, which, in my opinion, left the brand being sort of a sleeping beauty. It wasn't really because it wasn't technically sleeping. They even held a design contest in the pandemic for fans to design clothes that would actually go on sale. But the brand was just so undiscussed, so in the background, that I think the term could apply. Traditionally, a sleeping beauty is a brand that has great brand awareness, but that the public don't necessarily remember the exact design codes that made the house famous in the first place because usually they're closed, there's nothing to remind the consumer of said codes. This therefore allows a new designer to come in and reinterpret the original codes at the house into something that is modern, that works with their personal style, but also calls back to some of those things that the original customer would remember to bank off of that nostalgia. All of which is done in a very highly curated way so that the company can pick and choose which codes to reintroduce to the public so that they can have a higher chance at having a brand that is successful right off the bat. 
Though the main reason I'm tentative about labeling them as a true Sleeping Beauty is that they were seemingly really trying to get their name out there, with this Spring Summer 20 campaign starring Bella Hadid being their most successful attempt. It's just that while they were trying, no one really cared, and the archive lovers alone were getting far more attention on nostalgic Helmut Lang than their new collections were able to afford the brand. This all eventually led up to May this year, when the brand finally announced that they would be relaunching with the much-loved New York designer Peter Doe. Peter Doe is a high-profile, buzzworthy designer, with his biggest show to date being the Spring Summer 23 collection that evidences how really perfect his design style is to bring that attention back to the brand while rejigging their design codes to bring Helmut Lang into the future. It seems like all the years leading up to this is exactly what this was intended for. They made their money in the money grab era and wanted to come back with a bang with just the right formula. And to be fair, Doe really does seem like the perfect person for this. He had had the same kind of black and white aesthetic, the same focus on construction, and the same sleek silhouette fondness. Though, Peter Doe is still a relatively young designer in the industry, having only started his company back in 2017. So his opportunity for growth in this position, at least in my opinion, is one of the most exciting parts about it. And considering they just opened New York Fashion Week schedule with this show, Spring Summer 24, it seems like the CFDA also have very high hopes in his vision as well. When the collection debuted, however, it seems like everyone, including myself, was a little let down. Of course, there were numerous original Lang references, like the flat front trousers, sheer tops, text on tops, this print which is of the New York ad campaign that we talked about earlier, the calm colour palette that was very on brand, actually even this silhouette that's more boxy than Peter Doe's more nipped in waist silhouette is very Helmut Lang, and in fairness all of this is incredibly saleable so I'm almost certain this will do well in stores. But even with all these obvious references and it playing very well into the original ethos of the brand, I can't help but feel that something is missing. There's an electricity to their debut that was lost when the show was shown. And honestly, to me, it's more comparable to the Spring Summer 2020 show that I showed you earlier when we were discussing its undiscussed era. Perhaps I'm missing something, and over the next few seasons I will get it. I'm sure there will be many more seasons after this because I'm certain it will sell. The clothes are really just beautiful. Even if you're not into fashion, you might like these clothes. But at least for now, it's not there yet. And honestly to me, this looks more like a Helmut Lang diffusion line than a return of Helmut Lang the brand. It's really a shame to see this momentum going into the show be lost in this way, but sometimes even the most exciting placements don't reach their potential. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you did like it, please like and subscribe. Check out my beauty channel Underskin for more videos like this one, but about beauty brands, and my Patreon is linked below.